Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are really close to being on time. Look at us. Look at us. Okay. <laughs> there, are, there are not yet any, is the stream happening? Comments. <laughs> always a victory um uh, thank you everyone for being here um so yeah we're gonna go back to like an oldie but goodie topic um and talk a little bit about plotting pantsing in betweening um and maybe kind of how things have changed for us over time um so yeah so we're gonna kind of start with that with um how has your plotting process or your approach to plotting changed over all the years you've been writing. I'll start with Kyra. <laughs> um, in some ways, I started out a pantser and I am still a pantser. Um, I have never one day in my life had a plan for what I am doing with my writing. <laughs> um, that's not entirely true, but I did start a pantser. I am still a pantser. I think the thing that has changed for me is I got better at it for one thing. And I, I think, if you're someone who's been around our streams for a while and have kind of had heard me talk about how I write books before it's, there's like a little bit of method to the madness. So I've kind of figured out, you know, I don't have an outline. I don't exactly know where I am going plot wise, but I have figured out the things that I do want to know before I just dive in head first. And for me, that's usually character arcs. Um, so I think the big thing that has changed for me then versus now is you know there's still no outline but there's a sense of like this is what i want this character emotionally to end up a sense of direction a sense of direction <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. how about you megan um kind of the reverse <laughs> um but also with some growth or whatever <laughs> um uh sorry my voice is gonna sound really weird all night and it might crack um my allergies are so upset <laughs> with the change of seasons in Florida. Um, but yeah, I started a very rigid plotter. Um, like I'm going to look at the three act structure and I am going to follow it to a T. You are going to know exactly when something's going to happen. Um, and I think in part that's helpful because I do like plotting, um, since drafting isn't my favorite, I like that plotting keeps me like having something to move toward. Um, but I think back then too, there was just an element of, I don't fully, like it's not super intuitive story structure yet. And so it took me a while to really feel comfortable with different story structures and feel comfortable enough to play with them. Um, I, I did a brief pantsing, um, journey from about the 2019 to 2021 <laughs> um, and that was really fun and informative uh, but now I'm back back on my plotting um, I'm not gonna swear in the first five minutes because they'll demonetize this back on my plotting stuff um, <laughs> uh, and yeah so I do it a lot lo more loose than I used to so keep the structure, but with some wiggle room. Rachel? I am, <coughs> Um, I, <laughs> um, I think when I first started writing, I, I was like, oh, I'm totally a pantser and I'm, who cares, whatever, we're just gonna put stuff together. And then that led to like 10,000 words of absolutely nothing because I had no idea where anything was going. And I would just like throw stuff and be like, oh, I'll just figure it out later. And then have like a mess of words and like eight plots at once. Um, so now I've definitely like been able to rein myself in and I feel more comfortable not putting everything into one manuscript. Um, and then also like having not necessarily a rigid structure because I'm still bad at like endings, but at least having an idea of where I'm going instead of a I'll figure it out later attitude. <laughs> I know I've learned from myself that I need some structure just in general and everything I do. Uh, but I've gotten better at like figuring out a little bit more before starting and being like letting myself take my time before I start to figure that out mm -hmm. first. What about you, Kelly? 
I feel like I kind of started where Rachel is now of like very much the astronaut. Like I know where I'm going and I have a sense of direction, but I'm not like rigidly plotting or anything, but I'm trying to move towards more structured plotting. I always dream about going into a project, being super organized, knowing all the things. I never actually get there before it's time to actually start writing. So that is what I, I want to accomplish because I feel like when, the more I've actually plotted before I start writing, the more I enjoy the writing process and probably the better the book turns out, but it, it never quite goes <clears throat> the way I hope. So that's what I'm working towards. Mm. Yeah. Um... Kyra said once a pantser, always a pantser, but she's just gotten better at it. And I feel that way, but about plotting, like I've always been a plotter, but I've just gotten better at it. Um, I, I feel like when I started out, like I just didn't understand like how to plot. Um, and so it was just me trying to just like write everything down that was going to happen. And then I would just get overwhelmed. Um, and, um, and that made it really hard to even just like start a book. Cause I felt like I had to have everything written out um, mm -hmm. before I started writing and um, kind of, I like what you were saying, Megan, about how like you used to stick to structures a lot. I feel like for me, what helped was kind of getting to know all the different plot structures. I did like a series of videos on this channel a few years back where I just like learned about every plot structure and like tried them out. Um, and that was really helpful um, not to like find the perfect one necessarily or, or anything like that, but to just kind of like figure it out. And it helped me get a better understanding of like what makes good stories because when you start to look at all the different structures, you start to realize like there's a ton of commonalities between them. Um, and so that helped a lot. I still kind of like loosely stick to like a four part structure, which I like that one because it's kind of a looser thing. Um, but I definitely feel like I've gotten better. I've gotten more organized about it, which is helpful Other versus just trying to like write it all down in a notebook. Um, but uh, like now I like to use like a spreadsheet and note cards and things um, while also like understanding that like I'm not going to know every little thing that happens before I start and kind of letting go of that. And that helps a lot. Um, Rachel talking about endings made me want to ask like, do you guys know like what your ending is from the beginning or do you figure it out as you go? Almost um, always. That that's, tends to be what I'm more aware of. And like, I, I do know how I get there, but. Sorry? Oh, uh, Kelly's endings are lawful good. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like mine are chaotic neutral because like the way that stories come to me is usually I have an idea for a scene and then I'll try and make a story around that scene and sometimes that scene is the end, but a lot of times it's not. So then I'm like, I don't know what the story is, but I know that I want this scene in it. And then it's like building around that. So a lot of the time I don't even know the ending of my book until I'm like halfway through writing something. I am. Um, I'm actually kind of similar on that for how much I love plotting. I, I always know emotionally where I want it to end. Um, but I typically don't start thinking about like, okay, what are the actual details of my ending until I'm about halfway through? Cause then I have a better idea for, okay, who are the players on the board, you know, in the like vampire novel that I'm revising forever and ever, I didn't know if I was going to kill like the Edward character until I was like writing the last chapter i was like am i gonna kill him right now i don't know time will tell like mm -hmm. um and i i like that because otherwise i do tend to feel really overwhelmed by all the threads at the end like trying to predict what all the loose ends are going to be and be like and this is how we will wrap them up yeah yeah that's kind of how i feel about it like i usually know kind of like the themes of the end and like where i want the characters to be um, like emotionally um, and within their journey, but I don't always know like how the conflict exactly, like I kind of have an idea where I want it to end up, but now not how it gets there specifically. So those like specific beats leading up to the end are actually one of the things I like struggle with the most. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like taking like all the plot threads and figuring out how to like put them all together at the end to get to where I want the characters to be. So yeah, I think that's usually the area where I have like the loosest like ideas of what's going to happen because I find when I try to be too strict about like this is exactly how the end's going to work out by the time I get there I'm like oh that doesn't work anymore <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I find it so interesting that like I have trouble writing endings, but I've been in like I'm graduated now, but like I was in school for so long and I wrote so many damn essays that um like that's like that's the point of the essay is to like give a thesis statement and then build your essay around that. And I got so good at writing essays. So like I got so good at narrowing my argument down and like picking what like plot points that I wanted to include mm -hmm. in in this essay but I, I can't do it for a story and maybe i need to like recontextualize it like that in my own brain of like what's the thesis of your story <laughs> how are you gonna conclude it with evidence <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that is a good way to think about it because for me i've always found to some extent there's an in inevitability to the ending of mm -hmm. like if this is what you were working towards there's there's pieces of it in the story so being able to kind of pull out what those pieces are has always helped me figure out endings. Yeah. I am. Um, I remember back ages ago when tons of writing advice was really prescriptive online. I read a thing that was like, it might have even been Stephen King's on writing, talking about like, well, you shouldn't waste your time thinking about the theme of your book until after you've written it. And I used to like live and die by that because I was like, well, one of the greats said it, I have to do it. And I much, much later decided like, oh, well, why don't I like, it's not bad to have a theme. Why don't I think about it? And that like really, really helped me um, when I was in writing slumps and stuff, just being able to think about like, okay, well, what, what do I want to say about this? <laughs> what is going on here? I think I'm, <clears throat> I sometimes know the end. I sometimes yeah. don't. I sometimes half know the end. I also a lot of times kind of emotionally know where I want to get to, but not necessarily how. I've also, I'm just thinking through like things I've written recently and a lot of them are romances, in which case you kind of know the end. <laughs> um, but, but also I very frequently don't know, you know, if I'm following like a kind of traditional romance structure where you have like your third act breakup, I often don't know what the like get back together grand gesture is until I get there. Um, but sometimes I do. So I think for me, yeah, I'm, I'm a little all over the place on do I know the end or do I not until I get there. When I wrote a romance a couple of years ago, I reached the third act breakup and then I realized like, oh, there needs to be a grand gesture. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I didn't even thought about it. And so then I had to figure out what it was. And then I was like, well, now there's no build up to this. So like in revisions, I have to go back and like weave in like why she did this for the yeah that reminds me. <laughs> i have the literally i was looking at all the books i have on plot and structure and it's not even all of them i have one by my bed but behind me i had the romancing the beat just printed out because i have it in ebook form and sometimes that's hard to flip through and you can download um the romancing the beat beat sheet just like a blank one from the website so i keep that nearby because i like to have a romance subplot always so <laughs> It's hard to be with, with that particular um, structure just because like if you have a third act breakup in a grand gesture, it's like these need to be kind of equal to you. Like, mm -hmm. You know, like I've definitely had it where it's like, I don't know if this gesture is grand enough to make up for the thing that broke them up or like this wasn't that bad of a breakup. Do they really need to go? It's like that's actually, I think. For, for how straightforward romance as a genre often seems is actually very difficult mm. to pull off. I think yeah. that balance is like one of the most important and one of the most difficult things about a romance. Mm. And like making sure it's balanced <clears throat> between the two characters. That's one mm. of my romance novel pet peeves. It happened in that um, that rom-com that had J-Lo and Owen Wilson in it. And I have a lot of beef with that video for that movie. But one of the things is that like they both mess things up and him more than her and she's the only one who makes a romantic gesture at the end mm. pet peeve every time that's a guarantee i won't read your next romance novel <laughs> <laughs> we've had some really good the creative guitarist has been get, being a lot of yes. uh, craft book recommendations and if you know anything about our group it's that we appreciate a craft book mm -hmm. I love yeah, definitely lots of good recommendations there are all in there. Ones. <laughs> and some of these I recognize, some of them I haven't. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to read The Plot Garden, I think they mentioned. Mm. That one has a fun title, Plot Gardening by Chris Fox. I like the Take Off Your Pants. Uh, yes, oh, I have that one. <laughs> I have that one. <laughs> oh, you have that one? 
Yeah. Nice. It's a classic. It's really quick. It's great. I loved it. Um, I like um, when we were talking about whether we plot or pants and Grizzald said she plots unless it's nano season, uh, which is funny. And I'm wondering if anyone does something different, like do the, do you plot differently in nano? Cause I don't, I find I do the exact same thing I normally do, Depends which is part of why I often don't win nano. <laughs> I don't do anything differently since I'm already a pantser. But I, I do lean towards, at least in recent years, I lean towards contemporary and like contemporary romance specifically during nano, just because I think it's easier to, you know, not write myself into a corner in, in the real world. I might be imagining that, but <laughs> it, it, it seems to be working for me. I've, I've had some very successful nanos doing contemporary. Well, as somebody who might actually do one of the nanos this year, or both, I don't know, we'll see, but maybe not 50, I don't know yet, but I'm kicking it around. I might actually do it this year. And I have absolutely no plan to like have everything perfectly laid out before I go into it. I'm just gonna start and we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm kind of sitting in a different place because it's been so long since I've written. I'm considering of like, okay, I'm going to give myself like half a year to plot and then do nano. Like, I will be super prepared. I'm going to end up trying to do all of it in October. But <laughs> in October for a reason. I, um, Theoretically, I like this plan. <laughs> yeah. How much I prepare for NaNoWriMo exclusively depends on how close to November I finished whatever I was working on before NaNo. So sometimes I'm plotting during the first week of NaNo and also writing it. And then sometimes I like take multiple months to prepare. Um, I have honestly haven't seen much success linked to either method. I don't know why. <laughs> sometimes I win and sometimes I don't. Every other year, actually. Yeah, every other year I win. <laughs> so you're on track to win this year, right? Yeah, yeah, because so I didn't win year. last year, but I wrote my vampire novel the year before that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a good long. year. That's it's crazy. been a long time. Yeah. Wow. I've been working on it forever. Megan feels like it's been that long. <laughs> I know. I feel every day of it in my bones. <laughs> in your blood? Yes, yes. <laughs> I revised five chapters of it today after not wow. touching it for a month. So, well, if you could like leveraging screen, right? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm like it. blackmailing Megan into finishing it now. That's that's where we yeah. Been, so. <laughs> she has written the first chapter of the next book that we're gonna co-write, and mm -hmm. I don't get to read it until I'm done. <laughs> not only have I written it and I'm holding it hostage, I sent it to our favorite positivity past person who left comments on it and have told yeah. her that if she doesn't get done with her vampire book soon, I'm going to start sending her just the comments from this beta reader out of context. So. <laughs> Amazing. It's diabolical. <laughs> but it's working. It is. Five chapters. <laughs> Um, the creative guitarist said, I usually don't plot for nano, but I have written down some story sketches just so I can get started on the story without being paralyzed by the blank page slash screen. And that's something I like often recommend for nano. Um, if you are pantsing and especially if you're like a newer writer is to like, just have like some ideas or something written down. Um, so that if you like find yourself just like having no idea where to go, you have some, some ideas in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we had a couple or a couple comments, not questions, but comments about about plotting structure. Um, and Gwazad said she did what I described. Um, she tried all the plotting structures and methods, especially when I was still learning how to tell stories better. Misty Kate said she agrees about the four act structure and tends to lean toward it. So I'm, one, I'm curious if you guys have specific structures that you tend to go towards more than others. And Megan said she kind of started with three act. Um. Yeah, I always kind of, if I'm feeling stuck, I return to that like home base of three act. But the the longer I write, the more I find myself looking for like more and more niche craft books on structure, you know, like the mirror moment. And I'm reading one about like plot twists right now. And I, I've been um, 
finding a lot of inspiration from those, which is a lot less structure and a lot more just like, oh, here's all the, the ingredients that could be in a good plot. Um, yeah. Valerie26 says that they usually write down the scenes that they want to have in the story and then like, whose POV the scene will be in, what's happening, any subplot things. This just reminds me of what Erin does. Um, Erin Latimer, who's mm -hmm. one of the word nerds. She yeah. has... Oh my god! I don't know how she does it, but she has like little note cards for each scene, Big and then cards like, too. <laughs> it's like note cards upon note cards upon like sticky notes upon pieces of paper. I don't even know how she does it, but she like blots her series like down to the pencil wow. note card line every time. And I'm always like, how do you do that? <laughs> this yeah. is so impressive. No clue. Yeah. I'm always, yeah, I'm like really impressed that she like she can gauge beforehand like how much space she needs to give for each like beat and scene because that's what I struggle with is I'll be like oh yeah I'm gonna have like a scene where this happens and it turns into like three scenes <laughs> or it like ends up being like a couple paragraphs and I'm like oh I actually don't have anything else to say here so yeah I'm always really impressed by the ability to like get to that like micro level of plotting and yeah. I feel like there's some level of because I've never really messed around with structures and I think a lot of like where Aaron's comes from and for me and plotting, you get to a point, especially like having, when we were all reading that many books of like, it's in your head. You just like, yeah. you sort of have a sense of when things are supposed to go wrong. Like the exact minute in a Hallmark movie when there's going to be a misunderstanding. Like, <laughs> cause I, I am really bad at like seeing plot twists coming or anything like that. But if I'm watching TV, I like, I know when things are supposed to happen. You just, mm -hmm. you just, Take in so much media that it just kind of gets in your head, which yeah. is a nice way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I like four part structure for like the ability to kind of figure out like where and when certain types of things are supposed to happen. So for me, a lot of my plotting is like figuring out like what's going to be that midpoint um, and like figuring out like those big major points that I'm going towards and then kind of like filling in the space in between them. Um, of like what could happen in this in between time to get my character to where they need to be, so it's like nice to kind of like give me some space to move around in while having like goalposts. Yeah, I like that. Maybe I'll try that next time I pull mm -hmm. something pull something out. That sounds like a good idea because yeah, I, goalposts. I like that because a lot of the times mm -hmm. I have no idea where I'm going, or I yeah I I'm terrible at making twists. So I'm like, what's the mm -hmm. twist? What's the big reveal? I'm like, I don't know. Um, so yeah, goalposts is a good idea. I'm, um, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm currently reading the book Mastering Plot Twists by Jane K. Cleland. And it's been really good so far because I have felt like, oh, well, I'd love to have more twists, like something that surprises people in an ideal world. And that's not something that I feel like is always the most I feel like for anyone in a first draft is necessarily like the most natural thing to happen you either like over foreshadow or under foreshadow yeah. <laughs> yeah. so the book's been really good so far I find like the foreshadowing for plot twists is like one of those areas where you really need beta readers or even alpha yeah. readers to like help you out with because it's so hard as a writer to figure out that balance of like is it too obvious to other people like I know too much <laughs> yeah I, um, 100%. it's like um in this whole conversation I just I keep thinking about like oh well I don't do a ton a ton of plotting before I start writing that's probably the thing that's changed the most about my process it's like I don't hand plot out a lot but I do spend a lot more time thinking about the book before I start writing now um but once I'm doing my first round of revisions. Um, oh, I'm plotting so much at that point. Like we're doing structure for every subplot for the main plot. We're putting them up on the wall to see how they line up. And we're making a calendar to see how many days are passing. Like for me, the, the most important plotting happens after you've actually written the book. <laughs> I'm a big fan of moving the chapters around. So. Um, I know um, 
creative guitarist mentioned using Scrivener. I'll have any tools you use for your plotting. I actually, I love, I love a spreadsheet, just a simple spreadsheet. Yeah. If you go back far enough on the channel, I believe you'll even find a video where Emma talks about her spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, I also really enjoy Plotter, P L O T T R. Um, I think I got it for like 20 bucks once with a NaNoWriMo discount. And I think you can do a free trial during NaNo. Um, but it's basically the corkboard function of Scrivener, just like dialed to an 11. Um, and you can import it into Scrivener and stuff. So I've found a lot of fun there. Hmm. Reading through the comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much great stuff in there. Oh, we had a question. Where is Erin tonight? It's her birthday this week. So she's at a birthday dinner with her family. So yay for her, but bummer for us on the plotting chat. <laughs> I know. It's a real shame that Erin's not here. For the the real shame that she was born this week. <laughs> <laughs> As if, like, we, we don't have control over when these things are scheduled. And <laughs> we've had about no, this much more force. Kaylin has control about. over when these <laughs> things are scheduled. <laughs> we got some plotter love in the comments. Help people yes. talk about like, mind maps, <laughs> grids. Oh, Catherine. <laughs> My favorite way to spend 2 a.m. is plotter. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting, Misty Kate said, I've found recently while writing romance that I completely disregard plot to focus on the relationship. I always wonder how much plot I have to go back and add. It's always <laughs> so interesting to change genres and see how your plotting changes. I know someone else, I think it was maybe Tessa, someone earlier was talking about like how they plot fantasy and sci-fi differently. Oh yeah, it was Tessa. I discover you write my contemporary projects because those are character driven. So like the characters lead the project works better for me, but I have to plot sci-fi or fantasy because they're more plot focused. I can't figure out plot on the fly. So yeah, I always think that's interesting. I actually find when I wrote a contemporary romance, I like plotted in way more detail than I normally do for a fantasy or sci-fi. So opposite. I think the contemporary romance for me, because I also, you know, started out doing like exclusively YA sci-fi and fantasy and then ventured into contemporary romance a little bit later into my writing it's always like even now I when I'm writing one feel like I get to like a point where I'm like I have 40,000 words in this book and I don't know what's been going on for any of it <laughs> like, <laughs> I could not just off the top of my head be like oh yeah this is this is all the things they've been doing which is interesting because when I go back and like read individual scenes, I can like clearly articulate, okay, this is what this scene is doing for the story. <laughs> but I think just because it is like in a lot of ways quiet, it's, you know, maybe you have like these really big event posts depending on, I guess, your story and just, yeah, I guess whatever your story is, maybe you have some of those where it's like there are these really tangible things that you're creating. But a lot of the movement in a contemporary romance, at least for me, is like, hey, we had this conversation over dinner, <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. like that. And you want to still try and keep that active and like have some externality to it. But I, I have noticed that for at least myself that mm. the like plot of why contemporary sometimes doesn't feel super plotty. It feels mm. like, yeah. love it. Meanwhile, like I was writing like an adult contemporary romance and I find those are very structured there's a very specific structure for it. And so I think that's part of why I plotted a lot more heavy, heavily for that. Um, because I knew like it needed to hit certain story beats at story, certain times. And also just because it was a simpler plot, it was easier for me to plot it all ahead of time where I find with fantasy novels, that's where I tend to get like overwhelmed with like, there's just too many plot threads going on. Like, I'm just gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna start writing and see where we go. And then like maybe do some additional plotting down the road once I kind of get to know the characters better. I don't know, even for me just though, like even when I'm following that structure, like, you know, you have this part of the structure that's like the falling in love montage. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> you, like when I go, sit down and write it, then I get to like the end of that section. I'm like, what have they been doing for the past? <laughs> it's like, I know, I know that falling that's, in like, love. that's the beat, but it's just like, it, the, and when I like look at the individual chapters, I can say, okay, this is like, 
advancing this part of their relationship or whatever. Like, like the relationship is the plot. Like right. at the end of the yeah. day, there's also a level of like your characters think they're living a plot and the romance keeps getting in the way, but that's exactly what is supposed to be happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't, it, it's just like for me, zooming out <laughs> on, a, on a romance is always like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas like if I'm writing something that's like a quest, it's like, oh yeah, they're literally mm -hmm. this much farther down the map. Right. I can see that <laughs> movement. Whereas like with relationship movement, it's a little harder to be like, mm -hmm. where are they? What have they been doing? <laughs> I don't know, just for me, maybe at least. That did um, remind me though, I was just talking such a big talk about how chill I am about plotting. But for um, the vampire book, looking back on it now, it feels like, oh, that was such a messy draft because I've been trying to fix it for a year. Um, but it was one of my cleanest first drafts. And I think part of why that was the case is because um, I got my husband in a car on a very long car trip and I read him my plot scene for scene for the first 50% of the book. And I took notes anytime he asked a question, if he was like, wait, who's that? I marked down like, he doesn't know who this is. And like, if he was like, oh, well, why, why did they do that? I'd write down, oh, this motivation doesn't quite make sense like if I didn't have the answer for it. And it really, really made a difference on the front end. So if you are gonna plot and you have someone you can lock in a car and they can't get away. <laughs> <laughs> Megan's Google advice still love you after you after you after Yeah. Your upcoming writing craft book. <laughs> How to lock someone in a car and force them to give you feedback. <laughs> okay, we'll workshop that title, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. Come up with an acronym. I mean, I feel like the role in the writing world I would most enjoy is being the person locked in the car. Like, that is what I like to do. It's like, tell me and I will poke holes in it. Just hire yourself yeah. out to go on road trips. And it was so places. helpful, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure was nice for me. <laughs> I don't know how he felt, but I have a finished book, so... <laughs> Put them and in the still together and you know, like yeah. <laughs> um, Jada is has asked, ever tried to write a graphic novel? I tried. Emphasis on the try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it was really interesting. I was not at a great place in writing when I attempted to do it. Uh, just emotionally, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think that detracted from it. It was also like a huge like just learning curve it felt like even just like little things like I'd go to do dialogue and have to think like oh how do I format this dialogue that like is so natural to me when I'm just writing uh prose um there is a book let me make sure I get this right I did find really yeah, okay yeah it's called Making Comics by Scott McCloud um that is a fantastic resource if you are looking to write a graphic novel because it kind of breaks down like how you tell a story in like a sequential medium like comics um from things like thinking about like yeah just just like all these things that even as someone who's read quite a bit of comics and graphic novels i hadn't necessarily thought about like the storytelling mechanisms and it really draws those into focus and talks about how to use them so uh, making comics by Scott McCloud if you're looking for a resource on that. I had to read his um, understanding comics for a class in yeah. grad school. And yeah, he's just like so excellent at explaining yeah. how comics and graphic novels work. But um, Jada's question also made me want to ask Kelly about plotting, uh, writing a game. Mm -hmm. And how you approach that, like how's that different from plotting a book? really depends on the game of like how much freedom are you going to give anybody or are they all getting to the same end scene mm -hmm. like a lot of narrative games tend to do like a lot of like weaving in and out of like you can make choices and then we're all going to get back here together and you can make choices but this is where we're going to finish mm -hmm. so it really depends how you want to do it and then cause like leaving room for the player to have an impact isn't always important but in like if the narrative of the game is kind of your focus of 
is there a specific story you're trying to tell? Or are you letting a player tell a story? So there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, but it's a lot of fun to think about and play around with. Yeah, I just finished playing Horizon Forbidden West and the Horizon games are very like, there's a story and you're gonna get to the end and you're gonna take all the exact same steps no matter how you play it. There's like one thing you can make a choice on in the first game and there's nothing in the second really. Um, and then I like compared that to playing like Detroit Become Human, which has so many branching decisions that at the end of each quest, they show you like, here's what you could have done. Look at all these chances <laughs> where your choices diverged. You'll never know That's what those mean. endings were. Yeah, it's oh, stressful, but fun. <laughs> um, I we also had a comment that I thought was interesting from Tessa Claremont that says, I'm trying to plot a multi POV fantasy novel with interwoven plots, but there's one character arc that is coming easier than the others, which is stressing me out about how to structure the book. And I think I'll give my two cents on that. Um, I, I think that this is actually like maybe reframe this as like not stressful and like an exciting opportunity to like figure out the direction of your book. Um, because this is where you kind of can, if you're plotting it out and, and thinking about structure, you can think about, you know, is this book really multi POV fantasy or is it really the story of this one character? And we might dip into some other POVs, but it's like really their story and structure it that way. Or do you really truly want it to be multi POV in which case like back to the drawing board with some of those other characters and there's their arcs and like figure out how to flesh those out so that they're matching this one character that you've uh, really sort of figured out. Kind of There's been a lot of discussion around that kind of storytelling as people are watching The Last of Us show because there's been two Last of Us games. The first, the show is gonna, this season probably cover the first game and who the main character is tends to be kind of up for debate if you're looking at Joel or Ellie long term it's ellie but mm -hmm. a lot of dude bros aren't really down with that and they, in their mm -hmm. head joel is the main character so a lot of how they see what happens to the story they eventually hate it because to them joel is the main character mm -hmm. whereas if you're looking at it from ellie's perspective the narrative tends to make more sense yeah. so you can't weigh in like how other people are going to self-insert into different characters <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's been an interesting discussion and I think it's, yeah. it's an interesting choice in storytelling to have, like, Joel is the POV character in the games. Like, you are playing as Joel, but, like, he's not actually the main character of the story, which I think is, like, always interesting when stories do that. It's not super common. It's the same with Geralt in mm -hmm. Witcher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, By the second game, you're playing Ellie and someone else, I believe. Yeah. 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 Um... I think something to consider too is that just because it's multiple POV doesn't mean that they all have to spend the same amount of time on the page. Um, and so like Kyra said, it could be that there's one character who has like a very big character arc and they will take up the bulk of the page time, but that doesn't mean that the other characters don't also have their arcs and maybe you just don't need to see them quite as much. Um, I like to write a lot of POVs and I usually find that I have one or two who have the the main character arc going on and then the rest of them, they have their own little things and you just dip into them every now and then. And I like doing that. I think it sets the stage nicely for a cool finale. Yeah, I struggle to write that way because I also like to do multiple POVs, but I have trouble like figuring out the right size plots and like, or like trying to read Game of Thrones and like mm -hmm. embracing that you're in a POV character's head. They don't have a plot. They are serving a different plot. So in my head, like how that mm -hmm. should all function has never really made a lot of sense when I'm trying to plot. I'm like, where is that balance? I think it usually comes in revisions. It's easier to stand back once you've written it and be like, oh, look, um, this one character, uh, their scenes feel a little too random and I need to connect it a little more or, um, 
think yeah, right now, just, I'm guessing it comes from that prescriptive writing advice that used to happen of like rules for who POV characters should be and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. maybe stuck a little too far in my head. Yeah, I remember there was like a point in time where I would get stressed about like POV characters and like they have to have the same number of scenes or they have to have a full character arc. <laughs> Yeah, I used to think you could only have two in YA. Like that was the advice was don't have more than two. Like Ali Condi did it in like the third um, matched book. And mm. that was unheard of at the time. And I remember being like, mm -mm, you've bungled this. <laughs> and now I've tried to write a bunch of books since then. I'm like, I don't know, Ali Condi, <laughs> you do you. Or even the advice about like how side characters don't realize they're side characters and they have their own plot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because I know that I don't need to know what their plot is. Like if it doesn't serve my plot, they could be living their own life and you want to write them like they're living their own life. But their yeah. story does not need to be part of this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I love, especially in a horror, which is what I primarily write, I love uh, dipping into a character's uh, life to see how they are setting the stage for something horrific to happen later and they don't even realize it. As I said, I think me wanting this story to be this epic Game of Thrones-esque multiple POV is because I want to show off the world building and the cool elements of the world. That's fine. That's a valid reason to have a plot. Like, and I think knowing that's, that's, that's what you want to do is already a good place mm -hmm. to be. That's a good starting point, yeah. Yeah, I think that was like another like older writing advice from like several years back that just like everything had to be like plot focused, story focused. If it wasn't serving the plot, cut it out, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think, you could, I think things can serve the world building. That's really fun. I've uh, there, just seen a couple people on Twitter the past few days talking about the idea that we've really gotten into of like everything has to advance the plot. Um, and they were kind of talking about it specifically in terms of television and the concept of like filler episodes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, which I think is really interesting because it's like, well, sometimes like, and, and part of this too, keeping in mind that like TV has changed a lot as we've moved to streaming, like we have much shorter seasons. And I think there probably is conceptually some difference between like, you know, the Mandalorian, like, oh, we have six episodes and three of them feel like filler. Like that feels different than like, we have 20 episodes and six of them feel like, fill I don't know, that feels different to me, but um, a lot of people were talking about, especially in longer TV series, it's like a lot of time, actually, my favorite episodes were the sort of filler episodes, because a lot of times that's when you have a chance to just kind of like hang out with the characters and explore their character dynamics or their relationships or whatever, and it's a little lower stakes or whatever. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I thought that was a really interesting extension of that idea as it relates to TV, at least. There was an interesting discussion probably a couple of years ago now in the self-publishing world about the kill your darlings advice and some authors talking about how they had started making a conscious choice not to delete the scenes that were just kind of characters having great moments and like not affecting the plot or like even necessarily developing their relationships but like a slice of life life chapter here or there because they were getting a lot of great responses from readers and like looking at fan fiction and how people like to just read those about characters that they love just for fun. Like it, it doesn't matter that it's just a slice of life and isn't part of this big plot. So when you're starting to work a little bit of that in being aware of it and making sure you're not meandering off, but like if people enjoy that and you enjoy writing it, why does that darling need to die? And there's a balance. But it's an interesting. Way Cause yeah, I think that. it can be kind of exhausting in a way some sometimes to read a book that's just like driving plot constantly um it's nice to have those moments where like the characters can breathe and the readers can too um so kind of like on the opposite end andrew andrew asked so how do i course correct every character arc from being full on subplots man if you find out let me know like <laughs> 
Um, I think one of the big things you can do is looking for ways you can combine. Um, And maybe like, maybe a couple of those subplots could like condense into one. Maybe a couple of your characters have like similar motivations. And so you could maybe bring them together a little bit. And it does feel like something looking at revisions. Like if you don't, if it isn't like pulling teeth to add all of this in and you're enjoying fleshing everyone out like this, once you see it in hindsight and you can like, have some things that maybe don't need to be on the page, but that you can see that character, like summarize it or however it ends up working out. Um, yeah, this might be the underwriter in me talking. Um, my <laughs> books are always fairly short, but um, I don't see why they can't, even if they aren't happening on page, like you don't have to see everything that's happening for a character to have a full on subplot. Um, you just need to dip in every now and then or have like, one of your characters who's existing in the main plot see that kind of happening over here and be like oh that's weird um <laughs> so yeah i think you can mm-hmm. I, i'm in the very like do whatever you want in writing <laughs> mindset right now but i think you can make it work even if they all still have subplots it depends on how many characters there are <laughs> If it's less than 10. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what genre you're writing in. But yeah, yeah. I do find Probably. sometimes sometimes when I have too many subplots, kind of like Kelly said, in revisions, like I will sometimes notice very quickly, like this subplot isn't doing anything for the story, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, or like I'll be like two of these subplots are a little too similar, um, things like that. And that helps me figure out like how to cut things or merge yeah. things together. Or like one person could be doing two of these subplots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Jada had another question. Um, she asked, do you pick certain books to read because you think it will give you ideas for your book? I feel like the word nerds tend to lean the other direction. We will read books mm-hmm. and make that book our entire personality. All of a sudden <laughs> we're trying to write books like that book. <laughs> or like, Raven Boys, we find a series, and now this is what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I won't pick like specific Wrong. books because I feel like that can sometimes feel a little bit dangerous. Like, I don't, I don't, I just personally, like, I don't think that actually you're like copying or anything, but like personally, I'm like scared that I'm going to like want to copy it too much or something. But I do try to, especially if I'm writing in like a new genre, or I'm writing a certain type of book, um, to read like widely um, in that like genre or subgenre. Um, or if I'm like, you know, writing in a different POV than usual, maybe I might try to read a lot of books in like first person present just to like get in the right headspace. Um, and so that I can like pay attention to like what makes the writing good. Um, but I wouldn't be like, I want to write like a this fairy tale retelling. I'm going to read this other fairy tale retelling to get ideas. Um, more like I'd, I'd be like, I'm going to read a bunch of like other fairy tale retellings to like get a better idea of the structure. I think occasionally, like the first and last time I wrote a book with more than three POVs, I was trying to figure out how to balance that. And I did go back and reread Six of Crows um, because I love Six of Crows, Um, but also because that was one that I'm like, okay, all of these characters feel really fleshed out. Like, let's see how they you know, build and play off of each other. And there, I mean, there are things I like and don't like about the structure of <laughs> Six of Crows, but it was something that I at least wanted to be like, okay, how is she doing this? Um, and I, I don't, I don't think I know still, which is why mm-hmm. that book is now shelved. But um, it, it is something you can do if you have something specific that you feel like you're struggling with structure wise and you want to maybe go just see how other authors did that. Yeah. yeah, I am. Um, I don't read very much in the genre that I'm writing when I'm like actively plotting the book, but I have an idea for a long, 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 long time before I ever sit down to plot it. And a lot of my ideas in horror start with a trope that I want to do something with. Um, so, you know, oh, I want to do final girls. I want to do a haunted house. Um, and so when I have just the barest bones of that idea, I will read, um, anything I can get my hands on that has that trope in it. And, um, 
not necessarily to get ideas from it, but just to get hyped on the idea of writing that trope. Like, oh yeah, vampires. Mm -hmm. Look at all these vampires. Wow. Mm -hmm. I think it helps to like get your head in the right head space too. And like figure out like tone, like subconsciously. Exactly. It's for more the subconscious things. Yeah. Yeah. And I do pretty targeted reading after the first draft when I'm starting to think about like comp titles mm -hmm. and where I want to position it in the market. I think sometimes also I almost read more for like, well, what do I want to do differently? Yeah. Um, I, I think, and maybe that's just also a facet of having been around for <laughs> a while, <laughs> having written a lot of books is I, I think increasingly I'm sort of drawn to like, you know, almost thinking about, well, I've read a lot of books in this genre and here's one thing that frequently trips me up. How do I avoid that? So, so for me recently, one of them has been um, like in romance books. A lot of times I hit that third act breakup. I'm like, I don't love this. <laughs> the first half of this book is fun. And now I'm just kind of like, okay, oh, yeah, let's get to the end of this. Um, so I like then go back and try and, you know, deconstruct like, okay, what happened in the third act in all these books that made me like lose interest in the story? I feel like the romance community kind of hit a stopping point with that all together. Like I saw so many conversations around just this like <clears throat> contrived breakups and just like we, no one ever feels like these are, and, like, a lot of it comes from knowing they're gonna get back together. But once you're, especially romance readers and how prolific they are and just you read these again and again and again, it's, mm -hmm. you wanna find ways to make it feel more authentic because these things have to happen, but it needs to stay interesting. So a lot yeah. of writers starting to like really consciously look at that and just yeah. like what would feel genuine. Yeah, I feel Is like it? I can count on one hand the number of books that had a third act breakup where I was like, yeah, y'all should break up right now. <laughs> like You need to take some time. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I think a lot of writers have realized like it's possible to do a third act breakup that isn't like a literal third act break. Like they don't do they have to actually break up and say, we're done? You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah. they can be like, I need to take a step back. Like there's other, there's different different reactions depending on what has happened. And it doesn't always have yeah. to be a literal breakup. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just also like, for me, since I'm aware that's kind of a pain point, like I just make that less important in my books. Like some, it still happens, but a lot of times like, well, we're going to go there, but it's going to be quick. And we're going to instead spend mm -hmm. more time in this like, falling in love montage. Maybe that's why I feel like that is a weird part of the book for me. I draw it out too much. And I'm not <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying that works. I that's that's untested theory, but um I do I do think it is something where you get to a point where you are familiar enough with the rules of structure that you can start to play with it a little more. And maybe that I'm works sure. and maybe it doesn't. But you can you can always try it. <laughs> Yeah, I have a lot of publishing fails under my belt that will tell you a definitive. Uh. <laughs> yeah, almost, I've been thinking lately uh, because I it's you know the it's March. I was recently going over all the books that I read last month, and like where some kind of like pain points were of like, well, I like this book, but I didn't like this, or like, oh, this like the ending wasn't as good as the build up was. I'm like, okay, why? And for one book in particular, I'm thinking of, um, it was because it it like wasn't cyclical enough. Like there wasn't enough callback mm -hmm. at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also something that you can pull in where if you're getting to the like, yeah, the third act or the third act breakup or just before the climax and you're like, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do, is like go back to the beginning and then pull something, mirror it. Because mm -hmm. the like the book I'm thinking of, there was a character death as like, ooh, big shock twist. But like that character didn't really matter to the plot. <laughs> so it was like, what's the point of this character R. dying? <laughs> yeah, truly it was like, oh, sucks to suck. Uh, and we're moving on. <laughs> like, whoa, like what was that? Like, what was that doing for? So it would have been more impactful to the reader and the story if you had like killed somebody off, you know, that we like talked to at the beginning or that like mirrored a, a death of another family member, or, like something like that. And of course I'm just talking about death, but it can be like, a discovery or even even like a breakup 
sort of breakup that mentioned that was mentioned before or like a sticking point in the relationship or something but like yeah that that callback is more important than just like i'm just gonna throw something here because it's near the end Mm -hmm. yeah misty um, kate said isn't that the mirror moments and yes yeah, <laughs> yeah love there the are mm -hmm. there's another thing that's also referred to as the mirror moment which i mentioned earlier and that is a different plotting mm -hmm. theory which is that at the midpoint your character has a mirror moment where they're mm -hmm. looking at themselves in the mirror and thinking like i'm gonna lose something but so that's what i was referring to earlier but i do love i love a first chapter, last chapter, mirror moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Misty Kate says we need another word nerds trope off. I'm ready. <laughs> I want to do one that's I like, like we... romance tropes. <laughs> yeah, I would say we have to either do something specific or something other than tropes, because it's like we exhausted all the major tropes in the, in the one we did. Was the winner cool house yes yeah. <laughs> cool so house. I just a book that has I don't a cool think I even voted for cool house in the first round so <laughs> I'm still a little like yeah, about that one <laughs> I'd be um, interested if we like switch up all the like where all the things are even if we use the same tropes when we get to the same destination looks like in April we're doing a fictional character showdown oh. Oh. <laughs> all of us are like oh my god this, this is news to us wow cool i knew i'd seen something on the schedule i don't know where it came from but it's this is really gonna end some friendships i just know it yeah <laughs> not really but <laughs> i think it will get spirited <laughs> i've been loving like all the brackets on tiktok lately love yes them. love Very watching true. people do them <laughs> I hate the ones though where they stop at the last one and then they don't make a choice. Uh, where they're like, it's too hard. And I'm like, that's the point. That's the point. <laughs> I want to see you suffer. <laughs> I want to learn something about you. Pig. I always yeah. love like people will do ones with the characters where they're like, I'm going to do this just solely based on like their hotness. <laughs> and then they'll like, and then they'll start choosing characters, like the character that's like less hot because they just like really love them. I'm like, no, you said hotness. Mm -mm. <laughs> you said hotness. <laughs> hotness comes from your personality too, I guess. I think that's the yeah. lesson there. <laughs> yeah. um, Megan and Griswold wants to know if you've read the new Grady Hendrix. <laughs> I. <laughs> I think like Grady Hendrix is taking up so much space in my mind every day. <laughs> I'm so mad about it. He's the only person I can comp and he's also unknowingly my nemesis. <laughs> um, I hate how good that cover is. I hate how good that title and premise are. He's burned me twice though and I just don't think I'm gonna be able to. Have, let me know if you've read it. Let me know if it's good. <laughs> Yeah, when Aaron recently read, I want to say, yeah, Final Aaron Girls. hated uh, Final Girl. But I, I was so like, why did you pick it up? We knew we didn't like this. What, like, <laughs> have you not been listening? <laughs> I, I had someone recommend Horror Store. Has anyone read that one? Or do I need to like try that just so I can also be burned by Grady Hendrix? Yeah. <laughs> just so we can make sure yeah. we get all of his books. Okay, good. I, I was worried for a second, and Griswold, I was like, did you read that one? <laughs> um, yeah, because I've read Southern Book Club's Guide and My Best Friend's Exorcism. I remember Nicole and Aaron have now read Final Girls Support Group um, and didn't like it. I'm sure you've read, did you read other ones, Nicole? I don't know. It's enough people <laughs> for me. I was so Southern surprised Book when Aaron read one. Yeah. I tried Southern Book Club and I was like, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> I'm so sorry, Grady. I know you're a really big fan. You just sit in your like buckets of book deals and just think about me thinking about you. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I am. I'm done with Grady Hendrix for a while, but I do have to use him for comp titles because um, there aren't a ton of horror comedies being sold right now. 
So give me your horror comedy recs if you have them. Um, I read his. This year I read Suburban Hell and Night Bitch, and both of those were pretty funny. So, yeah, if anyone has any recs. <laughs> Two does seem to be the breaking point. <laughs> Well, we're right in an hour, and it seems like we are out of plot. <laughs> I've had my monthly Grady Hendrix rant, so we can call it here. Nicole said, I'm sorry, you have to keep reading this. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. I'm actually just going to lock you in a room with nothing but Grady Hendrix. No! <laughs> <laughs> Until you finish your vampire book. Yeah. <laughs> Circling it back around to that blackmail. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Uh, on that note, I think we're going to sign off for tonight. Uh, we're doing another nerd in next week. So come with your writing projects or your books to read or your crafting projects, whatever it is you want to do. We'll be here hanging out. So, and don't forget to subscribe if you are not already subscribed. I don't know who's watching this, who is not subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Thanks for watching tonight. We will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.